Welcome to the CTO studio, Gary Eastman, a registered patent attorney based in San Diego. We've had a few conversations. Thanks for being with me and chatting about CTO ness shizzles things. Well, thanks for having me, Etienne. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat. And, um, you know, I'm, I really I enjoy this type of kind of counseling, outlining, kind of big picture thoughts, because so much of what I do is trying to pick up the pieces when something goes wrong. So when I have an opportunity to kind of guide people ahead of time, I take it every time. I love it. So I've had a few conversations about the patenting process. And one of the things that I've learned very quickly is that if a patent attorney has a background in whatever your industry you're in, it actually speeds up not only the actual process, but helps with determining if the art is unique or if, you know, what can be added to keep it more general or removed. And so you have a background in electrical engineering. And so I'm imagining that You've had plenty of conversations with tech companies about what to patent and what not to patent. Sure. You know, one of the keys for, you know, patent attorneys is we're coming in to help protect something that's, you know, patentable. So in order to be patentable, it's got to be new. So oftentimes we're faced with technology that hasn't been developed before and for things that really aren't in the mainstream market already. But our, uh, you know, our background, technical background in physics and engineering and math and computer software, those are the skill sets that we bring to bear to help us come up to speed on those various technologies. And uh, that's, that's really the, the strength in our type of practice. is isn't necessarily that you know, I've done exactly what the inventor has done before. It's that I can come up to speed quickly because what they're doing is presumably novel and unique. And we need to be able to understand the lay of the land and then the subtle improvements over that. So walk me through the process. Uh, you know, why, why, why do people think that they need patents? And so why do they call you? When? And, and let, me, let me preface that with, as CTOs, one of the things that we believe CTOs should be preemptively focused on is protecting their intellectual property. Yeah. And I think that there's a couple challenges there is one, because especially around patenting, do we think that our ideas or our implementations are new enough and therefore we're neglecting what could be patented because of our own self criticism uh, or are we uh, coming out and preemptively saying, I don't care what it is, I just need a patent wall so that I can position my company and be you know, protected against potential future uh, uh, attacks or trolls? So, so w why do people come to you and, 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 and explain that to me? So a lot of times people come to me for, you know, a brand new product in a brand new market, you know, a kind of a new a new concept. And they come to me because one, they want to know, first of all, whether or not they can actually build it without stepping on the toes of someone else's intellectual property. So that's kind of a, a freedom to operate type approach. Is it okay if I pursue a project in this space? And sometimes we, we get an idea that, yes, we can distinguish it from those other products or not. And sometimes there are lots of barriers to entry. I mean, that's that's really the goal in developing a portfolio often is to create those barriers so that competition can't come in to compete with you. So one of the steps, one of the first steps we take is exactly that, looking out into the marketplace to see whether or not, you know, our opportunity exists. And then if we can verify that there is an opportunity, we can kind of see where the landmines might be technically with regard to their patent scape or their product disclosures. and then. We can then look at the second step, which is how can we protect our own inventions and our own processes to kind of take advantage of the opening in the market to capture that for ourselves. Should all tech companies have patents? Some, not all. I can't say it's a sweeping all must have them because just as if you ran a warehouse 
and you were deciding whether or not to buy a forklift, you would make a decision of how much that forklift costs you and how much it's going to benefit you. And patents are no different. There's a cost of acquiring it and there's a benefit of having it. And you have to kind of make that almost on a patent by patent strategy, you know, an assessment. Is it a good value or is it not? Sometimes it's a critical value to the longevity and survivability of the company. You want to exclude people out. Other times it's not as critical to protect it in terms of a patent. Maybe you can maintain some of it as a trade secret. Maybe some of it can just be know-how that you maintain within your company, you know, subject to certain provisions for secrecy so that you effectively find yourself not patenting strategically because perhaps the cost of a patent is more than that incremental improvement and locking down that improvement might be. So there's no sweeping answer. Generally, you want to make that evaluation, though, early so that you're not doing it after the opportunity to patent has passed, because then it might be clearly patentable. It might be clearly beneficial. But if you didn't do what you needed to do in the certain time frame that the law requires, then you would be prohibited from it and you've lost that opportunity. So the idea is, you know, is everybody mm. have to patent? No, but everybody has to think about it early. I love that. So thinking about it. So I want to talk about this this time, uh, this 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 time limit or this expiry. But before we get to that, I want to ask you. You mentioned uh, patent for the sake of internal know how and secrecy. Did I did I understand that? Well, the, you can't necessarily patent something if you want to have internal secrecy, because when you patent something, you're effectively disclosing it to the world which means you have to write a description that is enabling. That enabling allows someone else in a similar environment to practice the invention without undue experimentation or testing. So you need to disclose it in a pretty reasonable detail. On the, the flip side, though, is that if you disclose it, then it's public and you're only protected by the claims you get to exclude others from doing it. So sometimes you have to make that call. Which fork in the road do you take? Do you go after patents? expecting that you'll be able to get meaningful patent claim protection and exclude others using that tool? Or are you in a situation where you may not get that patent protection, so you want to maintain it as a trade secret and maximize your opportunity in the marketplace that way? Ah, okay, got it, got it. So it's in other words... Other, it's not both. Okay, so, so maintain the secrecy and keep it close to your chest by not pursuing the patent route. That's right. Yeah, there is but kind of a halfway... Sorry to interrupt, but there, there is somewhat of a halfway position. That is, if you file only in the United States, you can opt to have that application maintained secret until it issues. Typically, U.S. patents publish at 18 months after filing. And as a result, the published application becomes public. And others can learn from it. That's part of the process that was implemented a number of years back. However, if you do not choose to go into international patents, you can maintain that U.S. application secret until it issues through requesting non-publication. So if you're not looking at getting a patent across other markets and other global markets and you want to reserve only the United States, there is kind of a, a best of both worlds, which is maintain it secret, file a patent in the United States with non-publication so that it will maintain in the United States secret. And it only publishes if it issues. And when it issues, then you've got the patent protection. So you can decide to abandon the application if it doesn't look like you're going to get meaningful patent protection. And as a result, that abandoned application never sees the light of day, is not published, and effectively you get to maintain it as a trade secret. It's kind of a best of both worlds, but that only applies if you're not seeking international protection. Fascinating. So I spoke with a few people and and some of them had that uh mindset of you know when you're going to start when you th when you start your company when you know you you hit the ground running you you obviously are going to productize some ideas and that really from day 1 you start the the at least the patent exploration process to inform yourself about like you said uh, am I stepping on any toes or is my idea something that when that perfect 
coming together of product market fit and um, uh, gaining traction and therefore gaining attention, you have that protection in hand. Does that sound like a a generally sound philosophy or do you think that that is too general and that if I'm going to, you know, if I'm just going to build a basic CRUD app that just takes forms and takes data, does something with the data and then distributes that to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, again, I'm still stuck on the, should we all be pursuing patents because we don't actually know how intellectually and beautiful our solutions actually are. Sure. Well, I mean, that's, it's an interesting question because there is no one answer. It's really a product and company based answer. And it is really dependent. If you're coming up with a, a solution to a problem that is different, it's kind of an outlier. Maybe it's a contrarian approach to something. Then you chances are you want to at least evaluate your patent opportunities very early. But there are a couple overarching timing rules, which which I'll just outline really quick. Because the United States, it used to be um, the United States patent system was a first to invent country. And the system was identified and set out to effectively create a level playing field between various inventors, inventors in big companies versus independents. And the idea was that if you had conceived an invention and then methodically reduced it to practice over time and could verify that, then your date of invention is what your effective creation date was. And that's how you could determine who is the owner of a particular patent technology by who was the first to invent. So even if you didn't file today and someone filed before you, if you could get back to your original creation and conception date, it would be yours. That changed a number of years back. And now the United States is a first to file country. That is an enormous landscape change because that first to file means there's a bit of a rush to the patent office. And when you start looking at your criteria for you know, what do I have to do to file my patent? There are a number of things you have to evaluate. And that is, if we're interested in a patent, we need to file before someone else because otherwise we may lose the ownership of the patent. But there's also a catch-22 in the law that says in the United States, you have one year from your first offer for sale or public disclosure to file for a patent. So if you sold it today, you have one year from today to file your patent. Well, that that general rule flies in, in contrast to the first to file stat, uh, system that we have now. And as a result, you know, even though in the United States you could file a year after your first sale, you've run the risk of somebody identifying it, seeing it, making an improvement and filing their own patent during that interim time period. So my general rule is have something on file before you put your product into the marketplace. and. There's a benefit for that because a lot of countries, non not the United States system, but a lot of other countries are absolute novelty countries, which means that if you have a public disclosure or an offer for sale or sale before your, pri or before your priority filing date, you're not entitled to patent in those countries. So that can be a significant value changer for a company. If you present it today, it might take off in the marketplace, but if you don't file it before you first sold it, you might have just immediately lost all those foreign patent rights for the base product. So, so that's one of the those are a couple of the competing competing goals. As a result, there are, there are benefits to filing early, and there are a couple of tools that allow that to be done more efficiently. And we can talk about the different types of patents later, but a provisional patent is one that puts you in. So it puts you in the patent office, gives you a legitimate filing date that can be uh, used as a priority claim to both U.S. and international applications. And so that's one of those things. It's kind of a stopgap. It's not the full utility. But what it does is allows you to get your foot in the patent office door, gives you a year before the conversion. It's got to convert it a year. And it gives you an opportunity to go out and test the marketplace to see if there's some, you know, some legs under it. And then you can commit the more significant resources to developing not only the U.S. utility portfolio as well as the international. But that that keeps me on this track that 
really we should all be filing provisional patents because like you said w- what if you sold so you mentioned that if i build my product or my that contains my ip or whatever and it finds traction in the marketplace are you saying that it's too late it's too late to file foreign patent protection most of the time because most oh, for, foreign countries foreign have- foreign patent protection yeah, it, it most of the time, if you have a sale that is a, a you know public sale or offer for sale, most foreign rights will eliminate on that opportunity for sale without a prior patent application priority date. In the United States, you have that one year time period, but you're mm. also beating, you're racing the first to file clock. So you know you may, you have time in the United States, the so one year from your first sale or offer for sale or public disclosure or use, but you're on the race to the patent office. So somebody who might see it in the market might place might think, hey, I'm gonna file on this, and if I file first, I get it. And then so, there's so some this, caveats to that, but so this opens up a world. So so let's talk about that for just a minute. This this opens up the world for professional patent provisional patent filers right because they can just say oh this looks like a great product i'm going to go and patent that and then because the cto or the company didn't patent that can someone get undercut from their very the uh, the business that they created that's technically true however the statute reads that the first inventor to file so the presumption would be the first filer gets it. And if you could say that they derived or could prove that they derived their invention from your publicly sold product or disclosure, then you might be in a position to claw that back. However, then you're in a different battle. And the simplest thing that avoids and sidesteps all of that challenge is just file early and file often. File early and file often. You see, this is this 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 um, proves my hypothesis or my statement, which is everyone should be filing all the time. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, but a lot of times, <laughs> you know, a lot of times what happens is there's there's an evolution of a product development. As as you know, all CTOs know, you know, you come up with an idea, you come up with a problem, or come up with a solution, and in the you know. Uh, implementation of that solution. There are all sorts of pivots, enhancements, changes, uh, derivatives that come out of it. And so what some of my clients will do when they're faced with that type of moving target of where the core IP is going to be, is they'll file an initial provisional that gets your foot in the patent office door. Then every time they make an incremental improvement over the next year, they may file another provisional. For example, provisional one might be the core basic product. Provisional tool two might be perhaps a user interface or an operation, or some other functional improvement that's different and new and perceived to be protectable. So you file two or three or four of these provisionals. And then before the first one hits its anniversary, you lump all of those provisionals together and file a single utility. It's kind of an omnibus for all of those imp- incremental improvements, but it's a way to give you incremental filing dates so that you can then go out and continue to explore opportunity in the marketplace without having a one and done kind of approach. And it's beneficial because provisionals are relatively less expensive to file than utilities. It's effectively a technical description of your invention with figures and same type of technical description, but it doesn't have claims. It doesn't have other parts of the application that are required. You can file informal drawings. You don't have to go to the expense of formal drawings. So it really gives you the ability to get your foot in the door for those incremental improvements at a much lower cost. It gives you a great tool to develop your portfolio without breaking the bank doing it. So provisional is not defensible, right? Well, you can't sue on a provisional. Uh, uh, in terms of defensible, it's you, it's it gives you a priority date, and it gives you a file in the patent office. So as soon as you file your provisional, you can mark your products, mark your promotional material, patent pending. That gives you the statutory basis to do that. Then, once you file your utility that converts to it, you know it will publish at eighteen months unless you ask for non-publication, 
And in the event it publishes and then ultimately issues, if you give notice to somebody for the published application, then you'll have some rights. But typically, you don't have the right to sue for patent infringement until you have the actual issued patent in your hand. Because a lot of times, so patents the- get filed, patents get prosecuted, and they don't actually issue ever. Or if they do, they have a reduced claim set based upon the push-pull in the patent office. Hmm. So the provisional patent process with this sort of annual lumping things in and keeping it growing is almost like employee stock option plan where you ha- you have this right to execute and it's held for you in a way keeps the door open for you and you sort of reserve your spot and and when you can convert that to a utility that's when it becomes defensible and offensible and all that correct right once you get you know the the patent option is a good analysis because the the provisional provides the foundation for a later claim in a utility patent it has to be enabling. You have to describe it to a point where it's sufficiently described for someone else to practice it. So it can't be kind of half-baked. It needs to be pretty specific as to what you think of at the time. And then if you you know, make different changes, you file another one that's specific to that time. And when you lump them all together, that utility, that's the application that gets in the queue for the patent office and actually gets examined. That's when the examiner reads your application, does a prior art search, makes determinations of certain claims are allowable, some are not allowable, and perhaps some other amendments along the way. But until it actually Got issues, it. Yes. I say, until it actually issues, you can't actually file a lawsuit for a defense of that technology. Okay, so um, um, Is it possible that we are infringing on multiple patents without knowing it because we added a button to a form that when you click it, it submits to a server? Like, are, are, there, are there frivolous patents, just thousands and hundreds of thousands of things out there that we are infringing upon, but someone just hasn't come after us yet? That's a tough question because there are 10 million plus patents <laughs> and and trying to identify exactly what the freedom to operate includes is often difficult. But what's important to keep in mind is that in order to be patentable, something has to be new, useful and not obvious. And so when people get patent claims, those patent claims have to satisfy those three options, new, useful, and not obvious. And when you're looking at whether or not you infringe something, you need to go back at other people and look at other people's claims and determine whether or not every element in their claim is in your device or system or process. If every element is, even if you have other elements, it's an infringing, technically it's an infringing uh, product or system. So it's, it's somewhat of an arduous task to determine what it is, whether or not you're infringing or not. And so as a result, it's very important for CTOs when they're strategizing you know, their portfolio development to have a clear understanding of the competition, the, the patent positions of those competition, um, of their competition. And as a result, make a determination as to where the liability exists and where it doesn't. You can't it's very difficult to do a global comprehensive search on every single patent and whether or not you're infringing or not. You can make some decisions as to let's look in our product space, look in our competitive uh, landscape and determine whether or not we have a likelihood of infringement and then make a determination from there. But comprehensive global patent infringement analysis, they're very time consuming, very expensive. So often the stopgap is to effectively identify where those landmines might likely be, and then scrutinize that landscape more uh, carefully. Fantastic. So let's move to the process a little bit. Uh, So so I want to ask two things. So one, I want to ask, what is the the 
the what is the the lowest bar to starting this process um what is the no brainer every cto should be doing this anyway because it's it's either so frivolous or cheap or you know it's it's you just have to at least do this uh or uh, mm-hmm. or if the company has decided they're going to uh, pursue the patent route what is sort of the first what is what does a startup have to look for do slash budget for you know how do we let, let's talk about the very beginning of this whole process sure i think one of the things that is kind of most important isn't do we file this patent or do we not file this patent the biggest kind of step back position is what's our technology and how are we identifying monitoring and monetizing it could be you're monetizing it through your own products could be you're monetizing it through licensing but the key the key to the whole process is identifying what it is so one of the first things that i recommend all of my established tech clients do is have a routine evaluation of their technology because oftentimes you know management the c suite is somewhat separate from you know the key engineers developers in the lab and they don't have an opportunity to really kind of roll up their sleeves, get into the lab and figure out what's new. You know, the a lot of times the higher level executives are focused on here's the product concept. Do we have a product that matches that yet? And they're not necessarily focused on the subtleties, the incremental improvements, the aha moments that occur in the lab that help develop that product, but aren't necessarily pushed up the chain of command. So there's got to be a mechanism. This is exactly, honestly, Gary, sorry to interrupt, but this is exactly why I am having these conversations because I I, I am thinking that the C-suite, the, the, the management, in many cases, because we're talking about technology, a complete oblivious to, completely oblivious to all the intricacies that are being built and and constructed by the technology teams that is indeed intellectual property in and of itself, even if it's not part of the large architecture. I mean, it's it's a small component of a large part of the architecture that p- delivers the product or the service. And but I, so I love this idea that you're communicating around. People just are not aware of of the awesome that's being built. So let's do what you said, a routine evaluation of the technology, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do a routine evaluation, but even before that is you need to put a mechanism in place that allows the, the, the real doers, the ones in the lab coming up with those new ways of accomplishing a task or a new way of building something. You've got to put a mechanism in place where they can memorialize those improvements and pass them up the chain. And so I think step one is often the invention disclosure report, you know, or innovation. So maybe it's not classified as an invention, but, you know, you'll have a fiber optics company that, you know, is building these high-tech switches. But in the lab, one of the technologists identified a way to make a perfectly lensed fiber optic cable at a fraction of the cost. Well, that's not the big product. That's not the big box that they're looking to patent. It's an incremental little component, but it's a huge improvement over what the state of the art is simple couple page invention disclosure report hi you know i invented a method of terminating uh, optical fibers and it's a what why is it different well because everyone else uses this how is it better because it's so much cheaper simple it doesn't have to be a complicated thesis it just has to be a hey this is something so that you can float that concept that idea up the chain and then the second step is having a periodic review of those invention disclosure reports, you know, and once you have identified the the mechanical thing where how the mechanical process by which those innovations can be captured, then you put them up in front of a routine evaluation. Some are going to be, this is useful. This is not useful. This is useful. This is really useful. So you kind of prioritize. I mean, you generally put together a couple of your top developers, you know, maybe some of the product development team, a couple of the C-suite people that look at it in kind of a more strategic 
view, not just is it a cool technology, because you don't want to patent everything because it's going to be prohibitively expensive and may not accomplish your exclusionary market goal. But having the ability to, one, identify what you have, prioritize it, and then you can then start to determine, okay, is this a provisional filing we do? Is this so hot and so complete that maybe we go jump straight to a utility? Maybe it's something that's interesting. We might want to go from utility straight into international. So you can then start to make business level decisions on the technology that's cultivated. But if you never put in place the mechanics to cultivate that, you're not going to get to that second and third level. That is so that is so good. Now when you say invention disclosure reports, I mean this you're not talking about a specific format. You're just talking about a an email or like, hey boss, I invented a way to XYZ. You know, they can be informal like that. But in kind of more established companies where it's a more routine development, I I really do recommend a more formalized invention or innovation disclosure report. Because what that allows you to do is it, it it's pre-made, it's made by the management team, and, and it includes the information the management team is going to be able to consider before they have to make that go or no go or, or go halfway kind of uh, decision. And that way, they're not just simply looking at a two-line email that says, hey, I got this new way of doing something. It really does put a little bit of the burden on the technologist to say, hey, why is this? Imp- why is it better? How is it done? Kind of a, a basic description, but that gives the management team the tool, in an efficient way, to kind of arbitrage these various record reports and make a determination. So I do recommend a more formalized disclosure record. That way, it's easier to make the next steps. Done. Got it. Got it. It's like it's like the form that will encourage you to think about the four or five or six things that will help guide the review that or the routine evaluations that get done. So is this a is this a template that we can download from the web or do you have some examples you can send me of, of what they could typically yeah, I'm look happy like? To send you one. Sure. I mean it, there you. there may be others on the web, but I'll send you one because it's it's just a tool. But another couple elements yes. and I didn't necessarily I, we talked about the technology part of it, but what's also important is timing. So, you know, we talked earlier about the importance of having, you know, file before disclosure or you lose your foreign patent rights, you know, file within a year or you use your, lose your domestic rights. And then there's the first to file guidelines of getting it in before your competition does. Sometimes these invention disclosure records aren't perhaps done most timely. So sometimes it might be important to, you know, prioritize these. So we we ask for information for timing. For example, were we presenting it at a trade show? Was it the subject of a white paper or publication that was made? Is it going to be made or pitched to a, to a potential customer? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, you want on that form too. So it's not just the technical side. A lot of it's the business side. I, I, I really, really love that because creating then and being responsible for a, an invention culture, I mean, that's exciting. Uh, that requires some discipline. It requires some out-of-the-box thinking. And I think if we can set a tone and culture at a company, uh, I mean, even if it doesn't result in a single successful patent filing, I think just having the, that type of culture and discipline is, is probably going to benefit the company in many, many different ways. Yeah, it does. And it does it in a number of ways because it, it helps the, the rank and file engineers or technologists. It helps them understand where their contribution fits into the big machine of the business. Some companies encourage them to do it by a number of ways. Of course, you know, the engineers are typically pressed on development. They've got their Gantt chart on the wall or the schedule that says we've got to do this and this. It's got to be done in a in an organized way because you know it's a you know it's the it's the short path between various things. So they're really pressed on getting things done. So you have to you have to incentivize or encourage them to do these invention disclosure reports because one, it's not part of their job description typically. Their job description is build the widget that goes from here to here and do it in this time period on budget. So 
a lot of companies will recognize their their commitment to the in, in innovation disclosure record program by either giving them a, a little perk when they file one, um, giving them maybe some uh, economic incentive once the decision to file the patent is made, and then maybe another one to incentivize them once the patent is issued. There's a balance there because what you don't want to do is provide enough incentive. So the engineer just simply files, you know, 40 invention disclosures every week because he knows he gets 50 bucks a piece and he makes more on that than he does as an engineer. So it doesn't get his job done. So, I mean, and that's, that's the balance and I've seen it happen. So there's a catch 22. You want to incentivize and encourage, yeah. but you want to, don't want to disincentivize the, the real work. Uh, but it's really integral. And if you uh, go from the top down in terms of the C-suite, pushing it down the column to the, the even the most basic technicians, that mindset helps them think in an innovative way. Yeah, it's uh, uh, again, I think you nailed it with the, that mindset that works its way down all the way to junior developers uh, to be part of a culture that is inventive, innovative, and then also, and maybe my next, my next turn in this conversation is is to protect and have the whole team protect the intellectual property of the organization. So, not to frivolously give away uh, access to code base, to data, to but to really have a a way to to protect the intellectual property. So my question to you, maybe before we move on through the rest of the process is, is patenting the only way in which intellectual property can be protected? Or I know we talked about keeping it secret. Uh, we talked about patenting it. Is there Are there other ways in your mind where you walk into a startup or a technology company where you say hey really you you don't really want to patent this you want to x or y or z in order to protect your uh, ip you know you kind of hit the nail on the head there that patent's not the only way you know when we come into a new company we really come into it with an eye towards risk mitigation and that risk mitigation comes from kind of a holistic view of whatever you need to be uh, successful in your business, you want to protect any way you can from somebody else taking it. And you want to make sure that you do simple things to protect your employees from taking it, from your competition for taking it, or from you giving it away. And so there are a number of ways to do that, but it really does start with the employee mindset of making sure that your employee knows they're an employee or your, your management team is in the management team. They're in positions of responsibility. And that position of responsibility brings with it certain responsibilities, such as keep secret things secret. Don't let the code out without, you know, cert suitable protections. You know, man manage your IP portfolio to maximize its opportunity in the marketplace. And so it really starts with you know, the new hire engagement agreement or employment agreement and the employee manual that says, hey, you know, these are these IP types of things are important to us. And as a result, you promise before you ever step in our door that you're going to maintain them in the confidential way, in the secret way, according to our plan, whatever it is, just make sure there's a clear understanding up front so that you're not trying to chase these resources back. You make it clear right up front. <coughs> Next, you got to keep in mind what types of intellectual property you have. In a kind of a basic way, you've got patents and trademarks and copyrights and trade secrets, maybe know-how. But most of the time, if there's something valuable for your company, there's a way to protect it, either through one of those or perhaps a mosaic of those. And, you know, we talked about patents, anything that's new, useful, and not obvious, you know, things and methods. You got trademarks. Trademarks are logos, words, phrases, designs, things that are used to identify the source of your business or the service or products generated from your business. Those are pretty straightforward. You know, famous ones are, you know, on everything we buy. But it also gives 
you know, consumers an identity of this is a basic brand that we expect a certain quality of goods for, things like that. Just keeping people in mind that if you're going to use the marks, use the trademarks, promote your product, do it in a particular way. So education, ed educating your employees is really key. Then, <coughs> excuse me. Um, then there's copyright. Copyright protects works of authorships. It can go to the website, you know, the, the selection arrangement presentation of things on your website. Um, goes to photographs, code, software, text, things like that. Anything that's an author, a work of authorship is protectable through copyright. Trade secrets. Trade secrets have to be maintained secret. A trade secret is you know, any information that's by your company, owned by a company, subject to certain provisions of secrecy that give an economic benefit to your company. <clears throat> you know, that's kind of the boiled down definition. But the idea is, you know, secrets are intended to be secrets. You may want it to be a trade secret, but if you don't make it a secret, the law is not going to come in behind you and make it a secret. So example, you know, your global sales network, you've got a great product that's out in the marketplace. And you put on your website that you do business with these 500 customers across the globe. Well, you can't say it's a trade secret violation when your employee leaves, goes to a competitor and sells to all those customers because you have limited and eliminated it being a trade secret because you published it. So it has to be subject to certain provisions of secrecy. And same thing with the other aspects of intellectual property. Make sure anybody in a position of information knowledge for that information knows it's a trade secret. And don't give it to everybody. You know, if you've got a major customer list, you don't need your front reception a person having access to it. So limit access to trade secret things. Um, it's just basically, if it's important to you, do what you need to do to keep it secret. Then you'll have some remedies to claw it back if it's taken inappropriately. And then the last is kind of know-how, general know-how. That could be something that's not necessarily patented. Maybe it's not something that's a true trade secret, but maybe there's a manufacturing method that you get a better yield, a higher quality, less loss, you know, maybe a quicker repair. Maybe it's a quicker fix or design, but it's just how you do it. It's not secret so much as that maybe other people do it, but it's important to your business that people don't know that you do it this way. So those are the kinds of things. Identifying those, those assets early help you take steps to protect them. So that's kind of the other methods of identifying your intellectual property. And if you set it up early and make sure that anybody who joins your group, either through an employee or a founder or, you know, maybe a member for your LLC or just a standard contractor that comes in, make sure they have all sorts of protections mm -hmm. in place that they acknowledge before they ever start working with you that, you know, this is yours. They're in a position of trust and they're going to maintain it. And then there's the non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement that's essential. So before you ever let any of this information out, just make sure you have an agreement in place with the person you're giving it to that they understand it's trade secret or important information, and they're not going to use it for their own benefit or disclose it to others. And while that's not a, as powerful a remedy as a patent or trademark or copyright infringement claim, at least gives you a contractual relationship where they've made a promise. And if they break it, you do have some contract remedies. That is that is obvious and not obvious. I love it. <laughs> That's the problem. That is such the problem. <laughs> so many of the basic principles of intellectual property protection are obvious. They're they're no brainers. Of course we should do that. The problem is people say, yeah, we should have done that. Because they don't think of it up front. And that's the problem. <laughs> so the biggest problem with intellectual property failures is not identifying and strategizing. Because even with the provisionals and other methods, you you don't have to do everything right now. But you at least need to think about it, plan for it, and then execute it accordingly so you don't lose things along the way. Hmm. Very good. So what what 
have how many, how often have you run into uh, other licensing, open source licensing, reuse, and all that being an Achilles heel or an abrupt end to a starry-eyed aspirational patent process? Well, there are very few things in this world that are absolutely new. Oftentimes, you know, they incorporate things that have been developed before. And, you know, open source code is a perfect example. You know, it's done before, it's open source, it can be used by all with license or without. But those are typically just the building blocks. It's very seldom that you take an open source piece of code and say, hey, this is my product and off you run. You normally take that part, that part, that part, that part, and you merge them together with an overall operational benefit, you know, with all the, the database operations, the mechanical operations, even AI now. I mean, you could, so many of the peripherals for AI exist. It's the core operation that's the difference. And even some of those may be open source. So what you're not looking to do is you're not looking to repatent the open source information that you've got. You're looking to protect the cooperation and assembly of those otherwise existing pieces into something bigger. That's what your source or that's what you're seeking is the patent protection for those. Have but you you're seen, right. If, go have ahead. you seen situations where open source licensing have uh, became a liability or a, an impediment to this process? Well, it can be a liability in a number of ways. First off, in order to be patentable, it has to be new, useful, and not obvious. So since you're acknowledging it's open source, it's been done before. So is it an obvious combination or is it a non-obvious combination? That's, you know, that's a, that's a fuzzy line in patent um, prosecution because you can do a search to determine whether the system is new or not. And you can, clearly it's useful. Most things are useful. The non-obvious is a bit more of a, kind of a sticky analysis. And it's because the, the standard is, would it have been obvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art to combine piece A with piece B to come up with your invention? And so what is obviousness? It's somewhat of a, you know, supposed to be an objective standard, but that is made based upon a subjective analysis of an examiner. So sometimes you may have a view of non-obviousness. The examiner may have a view of obviousness and make a number of combinations from various references to make it obvious. And then you have to kind of debate which one's prevailing. And sometimes that's a difficult uh, difficult analysis. But you're, you're right in that that's a risk. That's a risk in that whether or not it's patentable because you have that obviousness standard. And if you're incorporating otherwise existing things to make yours, Sometimes obviousness is a challenge. The second challenge is, or second risk, is that if you're using truly open source materials to create your thing, if you can't get protection for that core thing, then you have very little barrier to competition because if it's open source, others can open source it as well. And as a result, you sometimes end up in a Me Too type product situation that diminishes some of the kind of a unique value to your business or product. Uh, but in most cases, you know, if you're using open source, if you're not going after patent protection, sometimes, you know, you can, once it's compiled and put down into some firmware, oftentimes it's difficult to determine what that open source might be or where the genesis was, unless there's some mandatory, you know, copyright notices required by the licensor. But most of the time you can kind of obfuscate the gen the uh, genesis of that software in a final product. So hmm. there are some there are some ways to combat that. Hmm. So you're saying that if I have an open source component and I sprinkle fairy dust on it and I try to patent the sprinkling process, uh, because I'm sprinkling it on open source, it diminishes the value because anyone else could use that same open source and make some change to it and therefore leaves me somewhat open to anyone else copying that. Could be, except you're the one with your fairy dust. They'd have to come up with their own fairy dust. Their own. Okay, got it. So, so 
the open source aspect, let's say there's a copyright notice where you have to disclose and you have to mention, um, the op- that in and of itself isn't necessarily an Achilles heel. Um, it's because, as you mentioned, it's part of potentially a multi-component uh, architecture or system that, um, you know, that the, the true value of what you've created lies in that. You know, you're right. I mean, I I don't know what code today is not written using a variety of libraries for code. You know, when you're looking at, you know, developing your software, you know, you're using, you know, you can use various languages, you know, you might write it in C or, you know, or flavor of C, and you might sprinkle in some tickle code. You might sprinkle in a handful of other things to accomplish the user interface, the various database management tools, you know, some SQL components. It's hard to say. You typically don't just sit down and start with, okay, line number 10, begin. You know, you don't do that anymore. The development is really modular based. And so even the most complicated software is used by library, uh, uh, cooperation of various libraries. So you're not necessarily looking to patent the small operational issues. You're looking to patent the way that software operates within a digital environment. And it's an interesting area because there's been a great deal of discussion and debate in the patent office with whether or not software is even patentable. And over the last eight years, there's been a very significant pendulum swing from patentable to wholly unpatentable, and it's starting to swing back. And it's been a it's been an interesting ride uh, in terms of being a patent prosecution uh, professional trying to identify what's patentable and how we can work with the patent office requirements to get it to be patented. And in the last three years. I think the patent office has issued four or five different software patent um, examination guidelines. So it's clearly a moving target because the Supreme Court rules it's not patentable. Other courts start to say it is patentable. So the patent office has done a great job at putting together some examination guidelines for their examiners, and they're, they're, they make that available to the, the patent industry. So you can kind of anticipate what rejections are made and what criteria are essential to make that invention patentable. And so you can include those in the written description because most of that information is available. But if you didn't specifically identify it in the application, you can't use it in an argument later. So those examination guidelines help us determine what fairy dust we need to sprinkle in there and what components we need to include. So it helps us optimize our opportunity and likelihood of getting a patent for a digital-based product like that. And this speaks then to the, the benefit of, of, of bringing someone like you in early and saying in an exploratory way, our company's livelihood is going to be built on this IP um someone with your background and technical experience and expertise and training could then say okay according to the guidelines according to the claims according to specificity this is what we need to adjust or add or remove from your ip in order to make it more patentable is is, is that the way you would contribute early on in the process Yeah, you know, one of the biggest values of bringing somebody in to that process early is to come up with kind of a, I mentioned it earlier, kind of a competitive landscape. And the way we'll often start this process is we'll create kind of a product matrix, product feature matrix. And on the the left side, the horizontal lines will, will identify your components, your process, your methods, you know, certain features that your product system does. And then along the top, we'll put in, you know, either known competitors, known prior art patents, known periodicals, things that disclose those uh, features that we're looking to protect in our invention. And so it's a very targeted type of portfolio development. 
And that targeted portfolio development is effectively you make that matrix and then you look for the holes. You know, the holes goes, you know, if, if you have a, a request, if you have a system that does X and X is not in any one of the references, then we want to see how we can patent X and prevent someone else from adopting your X. And so when it's, it's you know, that's a simplified version of it. But a lot of times these matrices are enormous and they're enormous because there's a lot of competition and there are a lot of subtle features. So we start to look at groupings of empty you know, where there's an opportunity to, you know, capture this particular functionality. The earlier you do that, the more you can use that intel to start to steer the development process through the, you know, into, the, you know, from top down. Instead of just simply say, we want this to do this and telling your engineers to do it, you can effectively start to identify these are the features we'd like to. Can we accomplish this technical task? And then start to help the development the development team down to the engineers and, and technicians to start to implement that to optimize your benefit. Because keep in mind, patents, patents are not permissive rights. Patents are exclusionary rights. So even if I have a patent on a technology, it doesn't mean that I can make that technology. It means I can exclude other people from making that technology. And I'll give you a real simple example. And it's it's basic, but it illustrates the concept clearly. And that is, you know, I come up with a method of coming of taking water from one place to another. And it's a cylinder that's hollow with a bottom. And I call that my bucket. So I've got a patent claim with a cylinder that's hollow with a bottom. And you know what, Etienne, you come in and go like, you know what? I love Gary's bucket. It's so useful. But you know what? I can only carry one at a time. So you're going to come up with a new invention. And that is you're going to come up with a cylinder that's hollow and a bottom and a handle. So you get your patent claims on cylinder, hollow, bottom, handle. You're going to get this patent because it's new. And assuming it's not obvious, that might be a tough one on this one, but you've got your four element claim. But in order to make your bucket, you would necessarily infringe the three elements of my claims. You would have the cylinder that's hollow with a bottom. So you could protect and you could exclude me, even the bucket creator, from making a pail. But you couldn't make your pail unless you worked out a license with me. Because I would have the exclusionary rights for the pail. You might have the exclusionary right. I mean, I would have it for a bucket. You would have it for a pail. So there may be a great cross-licensing. Now, that's a fundamentally and borderline silly example, but conceptually, it applies to the most complicated of machines and software and code and other things. Because if you look at it with that way, you need, you know, having the right to exclude doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to practice the invention. So that's why the competitive landscape we talked about earlier is so important because you want to make sure there's nobody out there with a bucket to prevent you from making your pail. Mm. So let's say, for instance, I have an idea that I am going to take books and I am going to sell them on the internet through a website that will give you the opportunity to search for them. They'll be categorized. You can maybe peek inside. You can maybe uh, select from uh, suppliers and you can click and you can purchase a book and we'll ship you the book. Yeah. What are the chances that I am infringing on someone's patent? Well, for doing that, speaking, you know, I I haven't actually looked at that particular issue, but Mr. Bezos may have a few things on that. Um, you know, with other companies that have, you know, a few different, uh, you know, methods of, you know, like the one-click shopping things like that. Those are. Those are in incremental improvements to an otherwise existing technology. But what's also really important to keep in mind is that patents have a finite lifetime. Patents, you know, this day and age, have a life of 20 years from the first filing date. So, being that, you know, Amazon started way back when with that basic concept, there's a fair chance that the, the bucket patent might have expired. And so if it's expired, you can practice that invention. That's the nature. That's, that's kind of the give and take of the patent office. You know, patents are exclusionary rights. They're monopolies. And the United States typically disfavors monopolies. 
in most circumstances. The patent program is an exception to that. And it's, it's based upon the notion that in exchange for you disclosing your invention to the world through the patent application process, you get an exclusionary right, a monopoly, for a period of years to recoup that investment. You know, founding fathers realized that absent some sort of exclusionary right, people wouldn't do it. You wouldn't invest the money because there wouldn't be an opportunity. To recoup that investment. And most of the time, as soon as the product would be out, somebody would copy it and you wouldn't be able to get any money back for the development costs and the time to do it. So it's really an incentive to advance science and technology. That's the basis mm. of the patent system. So, so, so that's the, one of the things. The, sorry, go, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, that's one of the things that incentivizes patent filing, is that you have that exclusionary right. But when you're looking at it in terms of what other things have been done before, that's why that competitive landscape analysis is important. Mm, so the, the, the original ideal of this was, hey, share your invention with the world so that they can build and incrementally improve on top of that. And your reward for disclosing what you've done is that you have the exclusionary rights to, to do what that do with that invention what you want up until the next incremental improvement. And anybody who builds on your invention, you have licensing, you know, that they'll have to work something out with you. But this advances and rapidly, hopefully advances people's um, like the, the, you know, the growth of society and science. Exactly. That you, you hit the nail on the head, you know, you get that exclusionary, right? It doesn't mean that people aren't going to improve on it, make the better mousetrap, make the better bucket, make the better whatever. But if they cop, if they're too close and they have to copy yours to help make improvements, then you're in a position where you get the opportunity for license. Oh, this is so good, Gary. Well, you know, none of it's really complicated, but it's hard to become you know, familiar with all these subtleties because there are a lot of little strategies that go into determining what process or what approach is best for what company. And so oftentimes, you know, I, I kind of say it in joking is that, you know, I don't expect, you know, non-patent people, non-IP people to know everything and know how to handle it or how to address it. My goal in these types of discussions is to educate you know, technology folks about a duck. I don't want you to know what kind of duck it is or what you need to do with that duck. But if it looks like a duck, it kind of quacks like a duck, you know, and it kind of smells like a duck, you know, it's probably a duck and you ought to figure out, you know, what you need to do with that duck. And so the only way to do that is just be a little aware of those issues. Because unfortunately, you know, once a lot of these time periods pass, you know, once you miss the opportunity for a filing that's prompt and timely, it's often very difficult, if not impossible, to get those rights back. And I'll give you a real simple example. Startups do it all the time. You know, you want to file, you've got a startup, you want to file for your trademark. Great. You got a great trademark. You want to secure the brand for your company. Perfect. You file your registration today. That's a public database. That registration application gets published tomorrow, and then every URL that you will ever think that that company might use will be bought by a speculator and then sold back to you at 100x what you would have otherwise bought it for. Simple things like that. So, you know, before you do something that's more public, make sure you do the things that you can to minimize your future costs. And, and there's not a lot of remedies for that, because if you're just filing it, you haven't started the company. You can't say that you're squatting on my trademark because I haven't filed it or used it yet. It's just a, you know, just little things like that, you know, that just help minimize the future risk for a company. Yeah, it's like when I formed seven CTOs, I went and registered five CTOs, six, seven CTOs, eight CTOs, nine CTOs, 10 CTOs.com. I think I'm Perfect. all the way up to 2,000 CTOs. So I pay a fortune in domain name renewal fees. Well, you might, but do you know what a cease and desist in a trademark infringement case would cost? Probably a lot more than that. And so it's the old ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cures. 
you know, and his seven CTOs, did you get the S E V E N or just number seven? I mean, there are little things like that that when you start I got, to look I got at the them, number, I got the number and the word, yes. Right, and, and there's a reason you do that. It's because being able to prevent someone from just, you know, waiting till seven CTOs becomes a household name and then they start knocking it off. Because early on, it's easy to do that protection and put those little things in place. Later on, it becomes more expensive. Yeah, and this is, this is why... Yeah, this is why I want us to talk about this because I want I want CTOs to to think like this. I mean, it's 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 difficult because with all the other pressures of delivery and team growth and product market fit. I mean, you know, the last thing in some ways you want to think about is well, what step should I take now for in case this thing blows up? And this is the thing about most CTO types is is where, you know, I, I love this difference between, uh, like, let's talk just colloquially about a CEO and a CTO. To the CEO, the future exists. Like, our product is going to be huge and it's going to be this and it's, and the CEO is like, we just have to get to this future that I already see and already exists. The CTO is like, dude, we haven't built anything. We do not exist. <laughs> yeah, they're the executioner. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're the ones ex- that have to execute. Yeah, it doesn't exist until we've built it. And so it's very hard to then take intellectual property protection as a mindset and I love, you know, the various ways in which it can be done through, you know, trademarks, copyrights, know-how, secrets. But it is hard to then project ourselves into, well, what when we do become a household name or if we do want to go multinational or if we, you know, we want to protect ourselves against big tech, um, you know, um, copying our idea. Um you know, it's it's a uh, it, it's not always the easiest mindset for the CTO type to embrace, which is why I want us to talk about this. And you know, you just touched on a couple things which we haven't really talked about. But you know, patents, intellectual property in general, they're assets. They're assets of a company. So you want to make sure the company has them. Like, you know, if you got a couple key technology people, make sure those their patent rights are assigned to the company. Make sure that the, the people that are writing the code have, have obligated themselves through copyright assignment obligations that, you know, we promise that anything we do is the company's. All those, they're, they're almost no brainers, but you'd be surprised how many people come to me and say, yeah, you know, we, we've got this issue. We have an inventor, you know, three inventors, and one of them went rogue and, and he left and now he's going to compete with us. And so, okay, great. Do you have the assignment? Oh, no, we didn't get it. Get it the day you file the patent. You know, you know, make sure it's clear in your employment agreement, all those things. But then you've got to you got to kind of back up and say, why do we have intellectual property? And why do we want to spend our valuable time and resources in protecting it? And there are a couple of reasons for that. And, you know, when you said it's protect ourselves from big tech a moment ago, that's 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 a very valid reason. But how do you get there? You know. Unless you're going to bootstrap fund this with your own 401k, you might need to go out and get intellectual property in place for the purpose of seeking investment or partners. And there's no worse position to be in when you're pitching your product, your invention, your concept to a group of investors and they ask about your intellectual property protection. You say, well, we're going to get to that. We're going to use your money to protect our intellectual property. Well, guess what? They're effectively, They're you're asking them to put money in a business that you even have, haven't even done the most basic things to protect. And as and a I, result- I can't tell you, know, you how, I can't tell you how often that is the freaking first question that gets asked uh, in so many, especially seed round conversations, the what prevents Amazon from coming in and- you know, and it's, 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 you're right. It's demoralizing. It is, it, it, it sucks, you know, but, but what you're touching on is very real for me, just uh, empirically. Sure. And what's interesting is it's not just the initial investors. When you, you know, invest in your intellectual property and you mark your, 
your trade names and logos with the little capital TM or the R with a circle, and you put all your copyright notices on all your promotions in your code, etc., and you mark patent pending on your products or systems, you convey, you know, you know, an outside appearance of proprietariness to proprietary technology. So even in the marketplace, it can have an improvement in your market acceptance because it's new, it's protected. It's you, you know, it gives a consumer impression that these are, you know, these are valuable, they're interesting, they're a step above the competition. And you're not, you're not going to know for a couple of years until you're actual patented or not. It takes that long to wind through the patent office. But during that, during that time, you're patent pending. You have that impression of proprietariness. That's thing one. It's, thing two is, you know, the, you get to the investment money. You know, hey, you know, we want to, you know, we want you to invest in our company. And in exchange for that, you know, we're going to use your money. No, they want you to come in protected because keep in mind most investors they're not going to sign disclosure confidentiality agreements because guess what they see investment after investment the deal flow that they see is beyond comprehension particularly recently and as a result you want to have this protected before you even step in there because if you don't then in their mind they're thinking well you just came and pitched it to us you just opened up you know all the details of your business how many other people have you done this to so we might already have an organic farm of competition mm. just by your pitching it and then the third is mm. what about the end game when you're going to you know you say protect from big tech what about be acquired by big tech you know it kind of goes two and two if you're not going to, you know, if you can exclude big tech from competing with you, then maybe you're the next Google Teams acquisition because they need that tech space to complement something else they're doing or some other, you know, acquisition. And without the fundamental IP in place and those other basic principles that just keep you on the straight and narrow towards protecting your IP in general, then you're at risk that your value might be less because, you know, you might not be totally exclusionary. You might have an advantage, you know, time-wise. And effectively, we're going to pay for the the time that we would otherwise have to commit in the lab. That's a very, very different monetization equation than, you know, we have an exclusionary right. You cannot play in this park unless you buy our stuff. That's a completely different equation. Wow. That is a fascinating, that is a fascinating constraint that can drive the value through the roof because I have... I have been in potential acquisition conversations where the acquirer in a downer moment will say, hey, you know, uh, technically all it would take us is, you know, $2 million to to reproduce this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, of course, there's a lot of implication and considerations, but as sort of part of a um, tit for tat, you know, devaluation conversation, that always seems to come up. It's like, well, what would it cost us to just go and recreate what you did? Um, so if you can say, well, you wouldn't be able to because we have these patents in place, so you'd have to license that from us, value goes up. Is that what you mean? Exactly right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So, you know, one of the, you know, you know everyone understands what due diligence is. I kind of have a different phrase for it, and it's the opportunity for a potential investor or purchaser to take your twenty million dollar company and devalue it to five million dollars that you should be happy to get because of <laughs> certain check boxes Absolutely. aren't checked. And so, just having an idea of what those check boxes are early, and that's you know, if there's an underlying theme to our entire discussion, it's just look at those check boxes early. Because whether it's patents or trademarks or copyrights or employment issues, or do you have product liability insurance, or do you have a, a business entity that's structured and formed and maintained, those little things are just simply check boxes that if they're not done right, that's the opportunity for that acquisition to be less valuable, for your you know um, valuation to be lower and be subject to the, the hole poking that so many investors often do. Gary, you drove me nuts. <laughs> I can just thank you. This has been so, I feel like we just scratched the surface of this incredible world. I want to thank you so much for being in the CTO studio. And I hope this is the beginning of many, many, many conversations. You know, it's, it's a lot like drinking from a fire hose in a short segment like this. 
because there are so many aspects of just thinking forward, you know, figuring out your strategy and coming up with ways to get it done. And, but routine, that's the key, routine. Talk to you Thanks soon. for having me.